This morning, I would just love to share some information with you. Um, I would love to get to know what you're about and how we can help you create synergy between two parties. Because um, as far as I understood, that's what the question was. Like, how do you create partnerships that work very well? Um, and in my line of business, I'm a creative entrepreneur that starts a lot of new things. And actually, um, it's always a fight for attention. It's always trying to sell this new idea. It's always David and Goliath when you start new things. Um, and there's tricks to get that done well. And I think it's about understanding what people want and how to communicate. And if by the end of this session we understand how that works, I'd be happy. Um, it's super interactive, so I would love to hear from you guys. Um, Oh, maybe that's not the best word in the room, but help teach me whatever. If I say something wrong, if I'm insensitive about something, please just teach me. I think uh, you're here to learn, but me too. So that's how it works. Okay, cool. So uh, I brought a little bit of an intro as I love TSH. We have a history together. Um, I figure none of you know who I am. So let's just start with that. I'm a creative entrepreneur. If I had the choice, the word entrepreneur would disappear. Um, I'm just a creative, I like creating new things, and because no one else wants to do it, I have to do it myself, and that's where the entrepreneurship comes from. Um, and when I wake up, I try to do this every day. I try to turn creative ideas into successful concepts, and success is whatever you want it to be. It's not just about money. It, it can be anything. Um, it can be making an impact. It can be reaching an, uh, an X amount of people. It can be whatever it is that you set out to be, but... To do so, you always need to go through the same stages, right? There's an idea, and then the idea turns into a concept. That concept turns into a plan. That plan needs to be executed. And then in the end, hopefully, you'll reach success. But if you don't know what success looks like, you'll never get there anyway. So this is the basic foundation on how to make any plan work for you. Um, and I think that also helps when we talk about partnerships. Now, about 10, 15 kilos ago, I used to be a DJ. <laughs> yeah, it's life. It's okay. We can laugh today. It's all right. Um, and one of the first things that I learned was um, I was I was in a group together with with Rob, my partner, but we did not use our own name. I know that sounds weird, right? But like David Guetta uses his own name, and there's all, a whole bunch of people using their own name. So what does it matter if you don't use your own name? If you don't use your own name, automatically you create a brand. And a brand is sellable and your own name isn't. So if you're into football, if you're into any type of sports or artistry or whatever, like Messi can't say, oh yeah, I'm done playing, you can be Messi now. He cannot sell that, right? There's not a brand that you can move. However, if you create one, you can. This brand has been sold three times. There's two other boys having fun in Spain right now under this name, dancing and doing whatever they want. And what I learned there was how replaceable we were. So there's this brand, we could put this on T-shirt. The brand can collab with all types of things, even when we're not there, which was kind of interesting. There was a TV deal made based on this brand where I actually never showed up. There was a three-year deal that we're doing all types of events. I've never been there. Um, and that, to me, was kind of weird, because now I had to understand we need to build a very clear and strong brand of what we want for it to be successful if I'm not even there, right? So people need to understand your rules, what you stand for, what you think is important, how do you want it to look, all these other things, if you're not even gonna be there. So the base of a partnership can also be the strength of your message and brand. We also did some nightlife stuff. This is the first time where people stole our ideas and brands, which is something that I hear a lot in the market that people are afraid of, like, yeah, what if I go to a partner or what if I go to a company or whatever and I tell them my ideas and then they steal it? Well, that's not a problem. Right? Anyone afraid of that? Ever had a... Right? Do you hold back when you speak to companies or partners or people? Ever? No? No one? Who does? Let's, let's see. Just a few hands. A few hands. Sorry? Depends how... Sometimes. Exactly, right? So you need comfort and trust and understanding before you share things, which is logical. Um, 
The thing I found out was I pitch ideas every day. I share the craziest things every day. I even put them on the internet. It doesn't matter to me how many views it has. And the reason for it is quite simple. If I were to take every single person in this room and I would give you the same idea, right? Let's think of something ridiculous. The, the, an idea fits on a napkin, right? So let's do Tinder for dogs, right? Weird idea, but I think everyone gets the mechanics of it. If every single one of you were to go upstairs in a, in a different hotel room and you would get 15 minutes to execute, everyone would come back with a different concept of the same idea, right? And so sharing an idea is not necessarily where you need to be protective. It's sharing the concept. It's sharing what you actually add to the idea. Yes? Sorry, there is a Tinder for dogs? Fuck yeah. Even better. There you go, right? Palm mates? Noted. Yeah, what else do you want? So that's a good example because I would never call it that, right? I would have come up with a totally different name, probably different colors, different whatever. So ideas, ideas aren't it. It's the value that you add to an idea. Not even before execution, right? It's the name you pick. It's the colors you feel. It's the communication tone that it has. All these choices that you make, that's where the value is at. It's not the idea. It's what you add. And so you can share ideas easily, but keep your value to yourself, and that's where you make the deal on, right? It's, not, it's never the idea. So, yeah, um, of course. I founded a company called The Avocado Show, which is basically a mono-brand uh, avocado restaurant, right? Now, if you think about it, and I did, um, I'm pretty sure 100 people on planet Earth had the idea of doing a restaurant with avocados. I'm not that special. It's, it's, it was all over the news. Everyone loves avocados. It's booming. It's doing triple digits. I'm not the only one. And so later, um, we opened one here in Amsterdam. It made global news, 221 million views, going super viral, whatever. But it's because of the execution and value that we added. We didn't call it the avocado bar or the avo bar, which happened in London. We called it the avocado show which is a little bit more unique, I guess, and, um, and it has sort of a brand promise in it. The Avo Bar was a really good place, but they just made everything you expected. In our place, we said, make nothing that they expect. I want everything to be spectacular. The shape of the food, the color of it, the music we play, we have pink velvet couches, and it looks like a loft that has nothing to do with a restaurant, right? Do the opposite. And so, the same ideas were executed completely different in the end. <laughs> but if they would have pitched it, right, then who would have had the value? If you go into a place and uh, tell them up front, yeah, I want to talk to you about doing an avocado restaurant. OK, I can share that information with you, because that's what I'm about to talk about. Now, when we would get there with the slides, I can actually skip. Here we go. Um, I can show you the value of the idea, and it's before execution, because I had like 100 valuable ideas, of which we could only execute like 70, budget or timing or whatever, right? So I have this idea, I want the, the, the ceiling to be a jungle, and I want that to be this, and I have all these choices. Every choice you make was time and effort. And if you actually can validate that choice, that's how you make value. Right? So an idea by itself is unsellable because it's worth nothing. But if you made choices, and now it has a name and it has a color, and maybe you even registered the name, or maybe you created a, a little brand identity already, or you made the first dish, or you made whatever it is, everything you add to it is value. And that's before execution because it's, you know, it's the value of ideas. That's when it becomes a concept. The difference between a plan, a concept, and an idea is that an idea fits on a napkin. A concept is that idea seen from every single perspective and angle until it's bulletproof. Then it's turned into a plan which has like, you know, timings and people and finance and budgets, which never stick anyway. And then there's execution that just eats up the plan and just goes on with life.
My, uh, Mike Tyson has a great quote on this. He says, everyone has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. So I don't know if you ever executed an idea, but it's close to being punched in the mouth um, when it comes to like sporting and games, right? It never goes the way you want it to be. So actually, the concept is the strongest non-changing thing of everything. Yeah, yeah. The same move done by a different person is exactly. No, I agree with you. I agree. I agree. So anyway, um, I had an agency which allowed me to work with anyone from Porsche to Mike Chandon and all these different um, big brands. And the only reason I'm sharing that is because the biggest learning I got from that is that all of them play in a different market. All of them play in a different target group. All of them play in a different level of uh, finance and really understanding what other people want usually is the best way to get what you want. I'll say that again. Understanding what other people want is usually the best way to get done what you want. Because partnerships is about win-win. It's about making everything work, right? And so if you only have your own perspective and your own idea, that's already brilliant and, and fantastic because most people don't. But to really win, you need to understand the other side as well. And that's what this did for me. I started to do concepts and campaigns and stuff that I never would have thought I would do, that I wouldn't really pick out of myself as, as a first pick. It weren't my favorites, but it taught me the spectrum of the entire market, which is something that really helped out later on. Skybox, which is my current company, was actually founded here at TSH. And it was based on a partnership and a deal. Now, all I need to do is find, is Lucien still in this building somewhere? If he's not, that's also fine. I could just share all the secrets anyway. I want, OK, I wanted to ask permission, but maybe we'll just ask forgiveness. It's better. <laughs> um, so today we're going to talk about what makes deals, right? In a good partnership, everybody wins. Now, I would like to ask you guys, what do you think a partnership is? What is it to you? Anyone? It's two parties coming together and uh, working towards the same objective. Close, yeah. I don't think it needs to be specified as two. I think it could be more. Partnerships yeah. can, can be bigger, right? It's more than, it's a collaboration to work towards the same goal, right? Is this something that you guys, oh, sorry, that, um, that is used in a lot of projects that you're working on? Yeah? Collaboration is an important part of what you guys do? Always. OK, cool. Um, I think this is important because really big deals are just as important as smaller partnerships. Anyone you work with has the same way of achieving things. It's all about understanding, and it's all about asking the right questions. So in a good partnership, I believe everybody wins. So what's a good partnership? I think it starts with understanding. What do you want? Right? What do you want? Does everyone in this room know what they want? A good budget. A good budget is a tool. Point is because you know what you're working towards, um, but some uh, and it's it's quite good when you're. I mean, for me personally, when I'm working on a project, to know what my end game is. I may not necessarily know how to get there, but I know what I, I'm working towards, um, and then I can work on the steps. So, when I go to a partnership, I can say, "Listen, I'm going to deliver the AIDS memorial." How can you help me? What can we, how can we work together on this? What are you going to benefit from it? And what am I going to benefit? I want this. How can we get there? And you, I may not get what I want, but we'll halfway get there, at least. But at least I know if I've got a serious person who wants a partnership with me, instead of wasting my time. Uh, my, my, my experience is actually different. It's um, that usually in partnerships, you figure out, ideally in the beginning, 
um, what you want to get out of it. You have a preconception about it, um, but usually by discussing, you get a much better idea of what you can actually get out of it, what you want, what's achievable. So I would say, at least in many partnerships that I've seen, it's quite, I, I ended up with quite something else than what I wanted, but it still felt like I got the right thing out of it. That you won, right? Yeah. Okay, that's good, because it's part of that. I think there's a, a big difference between two parts. The first one is partnerships that show up, like opportunities, are a completely different thing than going out to get a partnership, right? So when going out and the objective is to find a partner for the idea you have, it's best to have an idea, right? Um, Different business, for example, mm -hmm. and you need just to to collaborate together and make a, a one idea. I think you need you you may, you need some special uh, specialty, you know, spe okay. a specialty. Yeah. So uh, to create a brand uh, that can bring a new product to the to the audience, otherwise it will be it will be the same any brand else unless you have something new for the audience or for your customers. So I think a brand is very important and we are missing somebody who's really special in something. He, 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 do, he do what he, what he know, you know? Mm -hmm. And yeah, this is what I think, it's brand is something. Okay, thank you for your contribution. I think the most important thing that we're noticing here is also why half the room wants the mic is because it's always different, right? There's not a one size fits all in this thing. The only one size fits all I can give you is the empowerment of knowing what you want. Before you start asking people questions, ask yourself, what am I trying to achieve? <clears throat> and when it's outbound, so let's say you want to have an amazing event during Pride, right? That's quite a simple, clear objective for everyone to understand. I want this, so I go somewhere, whether it's the location or the caterer or whatever you need to execute that thing, that's going to be quite easy. But the other way around, when Lucien calls me and he says, hey, we're doing something with pride, um, want to join? Now, it's easy for me to say yes because I think it's important, but then we need to figure out there's no plan, right? Where do we start? Um, and I think either way is fine, but the first thing the most powerful thing you can do that costs no money and you can do by yourself is figure out what is it that I want, is the actual positioning. And we're not talking about pages, we're talking about one sentence. What do I want, as clearly as possible? And once you have that, something interesting happens, which is you'll get a compass. And what do I mean by a compass? I think I've done over a thousand partnerships by now. And I think out of those thousand, none of them have ever gone exactly how I planned. Right? There's always there's people involved, so there's always give and take. Now, the only thing I know, if we go back to what you said, is that if you want to go to Rome, then that's clear to everyone. And then the path or the road there, whatever. We can work that one out. Right? And so this is important to me because if you suggest new things or different things to me, all of that is fine as long as I can still see that the road is heading towards Rome. And I only know that if I know I want to go to Rome. So tip number one would literally be figure out what your one thing is. What is the destination? What is the end goal? What is the whatever it is. Even if it's three words, it's already more valuable than not knowing that when entering any type of deal making. Okay. Um, I've seen a lot of hands, and I, I want to give you all more than enough room to talk, but we also need to move a little bit through, so don't be offended if, it's, uh, if I skip you for a little bit, okay? Um, so a good partnership starts with that, and I think at the end, these are the three things. If you want to win, 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 you need shared goals, and the most important thing about that is it's not 100% fit, and that's okay. 
It's not about finding out which company has exactly the same goals as you or whatever. It's about finding a common goal that all of the smaller goals add up to. It's about sharing something, right? So it's, you're not looking for a perfect fit. You're looking for something that belongs together. That's enough. If there's cohesion, you're going to make it work. Um, I thought, actually, well, it's in my mind for a while, but I thought it interesting to add in now that for us, I work in sexual health, so I mm -hmm. work uh, on consent within the queer community here in the Netherlands. Cool. For me, when I'm choosing a partner, uh, value is important, shared value. There's mm -hmm. a lot of people who are active in sexual health who will go out and take ideas, and that's important, and this is why I raised my hand at the beginning, not because I don't want them to take my idea, because I know that we began this discussion on yep. consent within the queer community in the Netherlands, but because their messaging needs to be in line with the direction of the public uh, of public health. Uh, so Rutgers, the National Commission on Sexual Violence, and where uh, if I give them ideas and they go off and make their own narrative, or if I if they uh, are allowed to do that. Mm -hmm then they will confuse the landscape with different, potentially, with different narratives which could uh, backfire and cause more problems for us. Yeah, and I totally agree with what you say. Values are super important. Um, to me, it's about the highest arcs you can find, like the biggest t uh, container words you can find. If you ask me, a value can be put under mutual interest or any of that thing, like picking a partner based on whatever it is that you th think is important, that, to me, is a mutual interest thing. If we don't understand each other, there's no mutual interest, so we're out. You can word it any way you like. I think that there can be interest, though. Like, this, there are organizations that now are interested in discussing consent. But if I look back to the discussion I had with this same organization and the same people two years mm -hmm. ago, Yes, but mutual interest is also between the two parties. You know what I mean? Like you looking at a partner. But the interest is, OK, we need to raise the visibility and awareness. No, that's the interest of the campaign or the project. There's also mutual in Partnerships is about two, a minimum of two, sorry, uh, a minimum of two parties getting involved into a project, right? Uh -huh. And so you don't do that unless there's mutual interest. I wouldn't work with a brand that, I don't know, uh, the CEO is racist, something super simple. That could never work. That could just never work. There will, there will not be mutual interest on a personal level or, on, a, or an, on an entity level, even before we get into project level, right? It just doesn't work that way. Um, and so thank you for, for that. I think all these insights are super important. And I think for everyone in this room, what goals are or what interests are will differ. And that's OK, but it's just mainly about knowing where you're going, figuring out if you have the same DNA and you think you know, the same blood type, thinking about what are we trying to do here. And then the third winner, usually, there's the target audience, right? Or whoever that is. And they need to win, too. Because otherwise, it's just you know, two companies flexing off and there's no, what's the point, right? Um, so, I targeted these three things to make a successful partnership in basic. Obviously, you can add every detail, every little thing specific to your project. But if these three are aligned, usually you come out with a win-win-win situation. Now, a win-win-win situation is my favorite because when you pitch it, there's nothing you can say against it. right? It doesn't mean that every win-win-win pitch gets the uh, funding or it gets whatever, but it's really tough not to smile or not to like it or not to want it at least, um, making it a very e easy conversation to, to roll into because if you covered all three sides, then what is there to discuss? Timing and budgets, right? Um, and this one is tough, but I figured, you know, you have tough conversations every day of your life. Why not have one today? Mm -hmm. It's about perspective. So I, I've been in a lot of deal making that, uh, that didn't work out. And sometimes it could have worked out, but it didn't. And I think 
we should just be open and, and learn from each other today, right? So let's have this conversation. One time, someone was so passionate about their objective, about their goal, and mostly about their perspective of how they saw the world, that every time I put them in a room to try and get a deal done, and this is not about compromising, this is about understanding each other, they could not let that perspective go for a single second. There was no room to see anything from another side. There was no room to learn what the other party wanted, what the other brand wanted, or how things actually worked, because they were so passionate about their message. Right? It's a beautiful thing, I think. If you're passionate about your message and you have drive, that is something you cannot buy. But it is also something you need to control and you need to use in your favor. Right? And so a perspective thing is one of the biggest reasons why things don't work. And at the end of the day, when there's at least a minimum of two parties, try to understand the perspective of the other side. Even if something is clear as day to you, if it's the most logical solution, you feel it every day, it should be this or it should be that. It doesn't matter if the other person's perspective is not that way. Now, the beautiful thing about perspectives is you're allowed to change them, and you can grow. But you're not going to change anything by forcing something upon another, right? We've seen that in every single which way on Earth. It doesn't work that way. And so one of the tips I would definitely give you, especially if, you, um, if you're an activist or you stand for something and you really have a strong opinion about something, that is amazing. But let me show you a parallel. I'm very, very passionate about creativity. And I know it's not the same, but I just want to show you how I made a mistake. I can walk into a room and be mind blown by my own ideas and show the most beautiful slides and the greatest project ever in my mind. And I'm 100% convinced that this should be on Earth. And, and I could get a no. And the reason why I would get a no is because I walked into a room of people speaking finance and I spoke creativity, which is you know, the same as speaking English in France. There's just no point. Um, and so understanding each other, getting a little bit closer towards each other about perspective is one of the real things you need to ask. When you talk about values and DNA and you want to find the right partner, it's not just about sitting there and saying, okay, so what does your company want to achieve and what are your goals and if we get this many likes or reach or whatever it is that you want to get out of it. It's also about what do you really think about this and how can we learn from each other? Like what is your vision of things and what is my vision of things and not just walking in with a perspective like this should be it. If that should be it, then it would be it, right? So I think having these conversations is super interesting because even if the deal doesn't go through, you can still change someone's perspective or learn what the other side is thinking. And that's where it's at. It's not just about business, it's about personal perspective as well. Just wanted to put that out there. Um, and I think this is also the quickest way to find fire. Because if someone agrees with you, there's no discussion anymore. It, every single thing goes to the how are we going to do this. Not why should we do this, if you have the same perspective, sold. Not what are we going to do, doesn't really matter. You already have a plan. How are we going to do this? And that's where I try to steer every single conversation about partnership. How do I get to the how part as quickly as possible? Because that's exciting, right? And also there, going back to perspective, even if you have a million good ideas, let the other person have two or three ideas. Just because everyone is allowed to have ideas, right? And you're allowed to defend why your idea is better and your blah, 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 whatever. It's all fine. But at the end of the day, it's about perspectives. And if, if you only show yours, you will never know who you're working with. And I think asking them for their idea, their perspective, and everything that comes with it is how you truly find out who you're working with, if you're aligned, and once you are, now you're a rocket, right? OK, um, we also discussed this whole compass thing. So I want to share something very simple with you. I was asked in a uh, podcast a while ago, um, 
why are you a serial entrepreneur? Why do you do multiple projects instead of just one? Why don't you just make one thing super successful, go live on a beach? It's a very good question. Um, it's because I can't help myself, right? I just like the feeling of creation. I like the feeling of doing all these things. And so that to me is more important than the success part of it. I just wanted to exist. So to me, that was that. And then they asked me the question, OK, so how do you choose what you do and what you don't? Out of everything, every opportunity, you wake up every day, something comes towards you. How do you pick? So yeah, that's a tough one. And I found out there's three things, three triggers I have. And I think every single person in this room has their own. And that's cool. My triggers were, um, when I was younger, I did anything that was cool. Anything. You, did, you could pay me nothing. I, could, you know, I would even pay for, to do cool stuff. It doesn't really matter. So back in those days, if it sounded cool, I would do it. You could get me out of bed. That's cool. Later, you start figuring out, wait a second, I need to exist and you know, live somewhere and eat. So there's a financial aspect there. Um, whether you're driven by it or not is not important. You need it. right? So I found out that uh, cash can be a trigger for me. At first, I thought I did everything for cool. And once that done, maybe I should swap it in for cash. I was the most miserable person on earth. It's not about swapping. It's about adding. It's about building that club sandwich, right? You, you want both. And the third thing, which I thought was very interesting, is care. So I have a sister. You don't know her. If I wake up tomorrow and she's imprisoned for some bullshit reason, I have a serious problem I care about, and you don't, because you don't know her. Now, obviously, you could care about the situation, but it's not the same. It's not your sister, right? So care is a, such a super personal thing. And I found out that cool, cash, and care, they shape my compass. If any of those is on 100%, I'm there. If it's the coolest thing in the world, say less, I'm there. There's also a price to put on almost anything. So if you would ask me, hey, you want to go to Lithuania for uh, 27 months to teach uh, grannies to do something, well, maybe for a day, but not for 27 months, we'll give you 800 million. OK, sold, right? Let's be honest. So there's, there's a price that can make stuff that isn't cool worth it. Not talking about sellouts, just stuff you would rather not necessarily do all day. And then there's care, right? So if that thing where my sister would actually happen, I would stop anything I'm doing, and I would go solve that problem. Now, I know those three trigger points for me. And I know that if they're 100%, I'm doing it. But I want, actually, I want a combination of these things. So now the trick is every single opportunity that comes in or idea that goes out needs two out of three to exist. It needs to be cash and cool, or care and cool, or whatever combination of that. Minimum of two out of three. If it isn't, I am forced to say no, not because I don't want to do it, but because it doesn't fit my plan. right? And having a plan gives you a compass. And a compass gives you the power to say no. No, it's not strong enough of an idea. Yeah, it's fun. Yeah, it sounds a bit cool. Maybe it's 80% cool. That's not strong enough. I'm sorry. I'm looking for 100. Actually, I'm looking for something that ticks all three boxes right in the middle. And if I find that, I'm going to do that for the rest of my life. But until then, I found a compass that allows me to say no and allows me to say yes and actually keeps me understanding that I'm going to Rome. Whatever is going on, everything needs to get me to Rome. And I think just knowing that, even if it's a few words, a few triggers, just you can figure this out in an hour, really. It's so valuable because saying no gives you the opportunity to say yes when it matters. You will never know what's coming. If you, if you say yes to everything, you will never know what you missed because you won't have time to process all the opportunities or run into something that really is way closer to your dreams than anything else. So I put it in a few boring steps for you guys um, simply because that's what slides do.
Absolutely, yeah. I was hoping actually there was something to, to write on, but I'll, I'll explain to you in a second how to do that. Is that okay? I think there's like two, three more slides, and then we'll get straight back to this question. Cool? Okay. Um, so the first one is, what do I want to achieve? It can be the biggest goal in the world. It can be something very simple. It doesn't really matter what it is. Once you know that, um, the question arises when it comes to partnerships, right? Can I achieve it quicker or better or any other thing if there is a partner involved? Thanks, Luz. Um, if that answer is yes, then you go on to who could that partner be? Do I have an idea or will I be looking for it? Sometimes you can even create one. Eh? They don't even know. Thanks, Luz. Um, and then what does the partner want out of this? This is what we discussed, not just perspective, but actually also you know, mutual interests and in, in aligning everything out of that. Because once you know, um, it gets interesting. Is there a third party involved, which in this case is the target audience? Yes, and if so, what do they want? Right? We're just backstage discussing deals and campaigns, but what, is there actually someone waiting for this? Is, is someone going to use this, try it, taste it, see it, watch it, whatever? It's kind of interesting. Um, and then let's say it works. Our goals, our DNA, and our styles match. What's next? What does success look like? And this is very important because I, I truly believe that especially with the stuff you guys are working on, there's way more success definition than monetary goals. But most parties don't understand them. You, nine out of 10 times, are working as your own entity, so you're responsible for your entire feeling. And nine out of 10 times, the person you partner with is part of a larger structure. So they don't have the same thing. They don't need to understand all of that. For them, they have year goals, and they need to figure out how to get those. But it's important to share what success looks like, what makes you feel good, what makes you feel proud, what means you took a step forward, how does this look. Also, uh, if you donate 100% on a KPI or whatever, like, what is successful enough to do it again? Not hitting a KPI is not a failure. It's just a smaller step forward, right? So discuss that as well. Like, hey, if, we're, if we don't make that, is there still a, is there a chance of trying this again? If we learn, right? Um, and then my favorite thing is make it a dream. Um, I found out that the bigger the companies and partners you work with, they really love big ideas versus small ideas. This is what I mean by a dream, right? A dream is something you can work on every day but still not achieve, which I think is amazing. So if there's this big thing that could just work forever, like, I don't know, a school for underprivileged kids, every single year there will be new underprivileged kids. Right? So this, this concept can work forever. It's not about putting a Band-Aid on it right now. It's about dreaming big and say, hey, we should build a school that lasts forever, and then if, if we can do it, we'll, we're going to do two or three of them. This big idea makes your partner automatically think long term. Think, hey, how can I take you with me in next year's plans, in next year's budget? How can we create something that's bigger than just this little piece of success? And I think we are responsible for that. You're responsible for making other people dream and think bigger if you do so yourself. They're going to mirror it. Yes? I don't know. I think for me that's where I, I still have my initial struggle is because as queer people, we're continually made to think of our values last, right? Like that's really the first thing that goes out of the room when partnering with cis het companies. Um, and so you were just saying something that hit me where you're like, you know, they love big ideas, but when Rihanna went to makeup companies, they thought that was a small idea, but for the black community, it's massive. Hmm. So it's the perception of like, can That's you hold on? But if you hold on to your value, right? Her yeah. value was this, that it became the next biggest thing that everyone can be a part of. But it's that concept of, for me, I think, num number one for me at least is the value part because we don't often have that opportunity to 
know what our values are, but we have the ideas, we have the thing, and we go into it. And once you're far along in a process, you then have to think of, do I completely cut myself out of all this work that I've been doing or mm -hmm. give it away, you know? Yeah, so when it comes to, you talk about Fenty, right? Yeah. Yeah, so I know a thing or two about Fenty. Um, what I think is interesting about Fenty is that the entire business was built on one value. And so they're interchangeable in this case, which I think is interesting. So not only did she go to manufacturers and they said no, they actually tried it about 120 times before. There's 120 inclusive makeup brands that didn't make it. It's not even about that first. It's about what does it mean, right? So the reason they didn't work is because inclusivity had a different perspective from the parties that did it. Some people think, OK, I'm, I'll make five colors, and then I'm inclusive. That's not fucking inclusive. That doesn't even look like it for a person that understands it, right? For a person that has the hurt and the pain and the perspective of where it's coming from. From the other side, they're like, well, it's three colors more than we did before, so. Right? That's what I mean with perspective. This can be so simple and so stupid at the same time that you, you're almost shocked. Now, the thing I like about Fenty is not the fact that they literally did every single skin tone on Earth. It's the fact that they took inclusivity to a level that's fucking insane. Do you know where it launched? Do you know what the number one discriminatory problem is in the US? Number one. Number one. White versus black, right? There's a lot of black crime, black hate, news. It's all, all over the place. Do you know what's number two? Asians. It's insane. Even if you would go two years back and you would watch Trump on TV doing a speech where he just bashes an entire country out in the open, no one says anything. It's just, China is this and China is You're like, what the fuck is actually going on? So the bias around Asians is extremely high, especially versus China in America. This is a propaganda thing, right? You know where Fenty launched? China. You know why? That's why. They literally they, they just looked at it and said, OK, if we're inclusive and we're doing skin tones and we're doing body types on women, right? we're also going to do body types on men. Check out the, the men uh, web shop store. It's just actually American sizing, which is uh, great. And then from there on, they were just like, OK, so what does inclusivity mean? Can we do it on everything? Yeah. Inclusivity is not launching in New York. It's launching where they don't want you to launch. But I still right? go back to values, because even before Fenty, she said no to the Super Bowl, right? So her values were always strong on racism and sexism. And those things were how she then went to an idea to build it. Yes. So that's what I mean. I'm just saying, because you said, you're also here to learn. Absolutely. struggling with capitalism and money and should we trust it because we don't have someone going, how about you really figure out your values first, things mm -hmm. that are non-negotiables that you could risk losing money because we don't have money. We're coming from these indigenous populations mm -hmm. and all of that is playing into how we even begin to become entrepreneurs, right? And for me, yep. I think personally where I found myself in burnouts because I was doing things in a way that wasn't actually reaching I feel you. Thank you for sharing that. I think the reason why it worked at Fenty, and the, the greatest tip I can give you uh, based on the answer you just gave me, is if your value is basically the core idea of the concept, they cannot be separated. That's what happened over there, right? The idea of Fenty is not a makeup company. The idea of Fenty is inclusivity is about representation of every single person that hasn't been represented in that way before. And whether they make clothing or lingerie or, or skin care or whatever, it doesn't matter. Which means the value is inseparable from the idea. So if you find one, if you take the time to actually look inside and figure out what's my compass, where do I stand, what do I really want, you'll find that you're going to put these values in your concepts so tight and deeply that they cannot be taken out. And that, if you find the same person with the right perspective and mutual goals and interests, boom.
there you have it. That's the partnership. That was all the time I have today, unfortunately, but thank you guys. <laughs>